Um, hi, welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in and watching. Um, Michael Bagram um, and myself, Dermot Gracebrook, are just going to uh, revise a presentation Michael did at the recent Status Staffing HR and Ops and Z Forum for the financial services sector, which we held on the 11th of June. And um, what we spoke about at that event was the latest on the TES uh, regulations, an update on that and what's happening there, and also on the current CCMA best practice and tips on how to approach that and what to be aware of. Um, and we're very lucky to have Michael here to tell us all about this. And without further ado, I'll ask Michael to start. And every now and then, I may interrupt him with some questions. Um, and we hope you enjoy it. Michael. Thank you. Yes, we had a great seminar uh, with status personnel and Dermot. And we discussed the temporary employment services. We discussed the issues that are going to arise with regard to the changes in the Labor Relations Act, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. We're expecting our parliament, the South African parliament, to change our labor law uh, within months. We suspect it will happen in the first quarter of 2014. The industry is very worried, and I know the um, business community are exceptionally worried as to what will happen to the employment of individuals once the new law becomes law. And what we're trying to do is to explore this law to see how it's going to affect employers, how it will affect the temporary employment service providers, and obviously the placement agencies. Now the reality of the situation is that it's not good, and it isn't good to the extent that the trade unions are pushing for the banning of labor brokers, they're pushing for the banning of temporary employment service providers. That the government has indicated that they're not going to ban. So there's the first piece of good news. Over and above that, the government has done a dirty. They have now changed the situation from what took place at NEDLAC, which was the body set up by our parliament for the employers, the trade unions, and the government to sit and negotiate the changes to our labor law. Now, this negotiation, after two years of painstaking negotiation, led to the parties agreeing that six months of employment would be the accepted time for a TES or temporary employment service to place someone at the workplace, either through a labor broker or through a placement agency. Now, the problem that you've got is that after six months, it was agreed between the parties, and must remember the business community were not happy to agree, but a good settlement is one where you have two parties who come out not smiling, come out frowning. And so the agreement in that particular instance was where the parties agreed on six months. After the six months, then that employee would deem to be permanent at that particular place of employment and not an employee of the temporary employment service or the labor broker. However, when this landed up at the parliamentary labor portfolio committee, they then said that they're going to reduce that to three months. So you can see the devastation from six months down to three months. Now just think of an example. One short example is where your secretary goes off on maternity leave, and maternity leave is four months, as per the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. Now you then have to replace her because you can't have someone not answering the phone at your work. So you go and you find a new secretary, who you're going to employ for four months whilst Cheryl is out on maternity. On the fourth month, your new secretary, Susan, is deemed by legislation to be permanent. So when Cheryl wants to come back from her maternity leave, you've got a particular problem. Now we've got to look, look at the word deemed. What does it actually mean? How are we going to handle it? And how are the temporary employment services and to be able to convince their clients, the people who are out there creating employment, how are we going to convince them that in fact Susan, who's come in as the temporary employee, is not deemed to be permanent? Well, it's obvious. What you need to do is you need to put together proper contracts, 
you need proper explanations, you need Susan who's coming in to sign that she fully understands that she's going to be there for four months only, you need to put in the proper explanation as to why the pregnant lady is going to come back, and you need to explain to the world out there that the four months is necessary in circumstances such as this. So we'll be able, as lawyers, holding hands with the temporary employment service providers, we'll be able to overcome that deeming provision. And that's why I'm wanting the industry to look at it from a positive angle, as opposed to we're going to have a lot of those bucky brigade, the people who are out there who don't follow the law, who are trying to grab as much of the pie as possible, we're going to try and push them out because they're not going to be able to do this properly and overcome the deeming provision. Michael, if I could ask you just a question on that example, I think um, I could imagine if I'm putting myself in the in the place that is perhaps not business or certainly not the uh, employment business. Um, the 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 four month situation or the three months. Um, you, you're talking about temporary employment services, but the question would probably arise with the example of three months for temporary employment services and then you've got a four-month situation, is why would a fixed-term contract not be appropriate? Because fixed-term contract technically isn't the same as flexi staffing or temporary employment. Yeah. So so I suppose the unions would argue, is business really hampered in that way? And and in your opinion, what's the answer to that? And do you think it is a hampered business, not to have actual flexi staffing? Thank you. That's, that's a legitimate concern. So you employ Susan on a fixed-term four-month contract. Unfortunately, the way the law is going to be worded and the way it will be passed early next year in 2014 is it doesn't matter what you've signed, the law will override the contract. In other words, one day after the three months, you become automatically a permanent employee. You are deemed to be permanent. You in that fixed term contract need to be able to explain to a court an arbitrator, um, the CCMA, or whatever body that's going to override this and explain to them why you specifically chose the fixed term contract. In other words, the contract in Latin is called pro non scripto, as if it wasn't written. And you then, as an employer and then temporary employment service, you need to explain why it is actually written because it's deemed to be thrown on script there. So the, the bottom line is, I, I don't think we'll be, uh, sorry about this, I apologize. This, this just shows you this is happening live and, and this isn't pre-prepared or scripted? It's certainly not. I don't have any script over here. <laughs> I, certainly didn't, I, I didn't allow for my telephone to, to come in. And if Michael's telephone is allowed to ring, my <laughs> allowed to drink coffee. <laughs> Okay, so we, we've, where we left off, <laughs> where we left off was that the fixed term contract itself um, will be deemed to be overridden by the law. Now, it is a strange concept for the business community. Every business person believes in contracts. In other words, if I sell you a diamond for $100,000, you expect that to be reflected in the contract, and you expect that on the handing over of the hundred thousand dollars, that I would hand you the diamond, and you would also expect that that would be the diamond that we identified as being worth the hundred thousand dollars. All that will be reflected in a contract, and if I hand you the diamond and you don't hand me the hundred thousand dollars, I will take that contract which you have signed, and I'll go to a court and I'll sue you in terms of the contract. So we in the business community believe that we are bound by contracts. The problem with the labor law is that the contracts are secondary to the law. In other words, if I say that I'm going to employ Dermot for six months and I can give him a month's notice in that six month period, I can't in reality give it to him because the labor law says that you can only give him that notice if in fact you follow the proper process and you have a good reason.
the problem that you've got um, in our labor law is that the labor law expects the parties to follow a process as per the Labor Relations Act. <clears throat> and if the Labor Relations Act says that a person is deemed to be permanent and you've given them a four-month contract, i.e. non-permanency, that deeming provision overrides the contract entirely and it's very difficult for the business community to understand why is that. So just to answer Dermot's question, short-term contract doesn't help us other than the explanation. <coughs> I, I still believe that the business community will adapt. We will understand um, how we can adapt to the deeming provision. We will understand how we can adapt to all the changes in law. Already, the clients of my law firm are understanding, because we've taken this out to them, are understanding that the labor law is there for us to use, and we must use it as a tool to create more business. Unfortunately, the business community out there are panicking. They are worried about these changes. Many of the business community are saying that we won't invest further in our own businesses. They are saying it's far cheaper to invest elsewhere. The returns will be better. And they are also saying that if the labor law is going to become harsher, why should we, in essence, follow this? Now, we know in South Africa today that there's a 40% unemployment. We've just had the quarterly review that's come out of our government. The statistician general has said that the youth are close on 50% unemployed. We, as a temporary employment service community, need to try and ensure that these people, the unemployed, gain a foothold into the business community. They're doing, not only are they good for their own businesses, but they're doing a service to South Africa. And I strongly believe that we need to grapple with this problem, if we can call it a problem. And that grappling will help us improve the economy. The Chinese tell us that um, a, a situation of this nature is an urgent opportunity. They call it an urgent opportunity. I'm telling you that if there is blood running in the streets, that's the time when the business community need to step in and make a profit out of it. There was a wonderful book written many years ago about that. Those who are willing to take the situation, grab it with both hands, they are the people that are going to be able to increase their businesses, they are the people that are going to move forward. So the business community would be silly to be put off because there is some negativity in the legislation. My, my strong understanding of the legislation is that the courts in due course will obviously look at the way the businesses are run. They will test to see if people are trying to bastardize the law and they will fully understand that when you bring someone on for a legitimate purpose, say for six months or 12 months or even five years, they will fully understand as to how you can overcome this problem. Now, you must understand why the unions are pushing for this. The unions are pushing for the deeming provision as a permanency for one reason only. There are many businesses out there, and I think they're wrong, and I am always telling my clients don't do this, who are saying, well, we can avoid the law of dismissal by employing people on, say, a two-month contract. At the end of the contract, we say, that's the end of your contract, cheers. Or what we could do at the end of the contract, if we still need you, we'll give you another contract. And we'll roll it over, and the only reason why they're doing that is to avoid the advent of the labor law. Now, the unions take exception to this. I take exception to that. Because you employ people on a contract according to the nature and exigency of your business. You don't employ them for two months to override the labor law. You employ them for two months if you only have finances for two months. Uh, for instance, let's say you get a contract to build a wall. That wall is going to take you three months to build. 
you need bricklayers for that three months, you would employ them on a three-month contract. It's understandable. But if someone has engaged you to build the house, you know that it's going to take you two years to build the house. But in case you don't feel like being uh, caught in the labor law, you employ everyone for two months. At the end of the two months, you weed out those that didn't fit in or uh, cause some trouble or come to work late, and you say that's the end of your contract. The others, you then say, well, you worked out good. I'll give you another two-month contract. And that's the wrong way of doing that. And we understand how people have bastardized the law on that process. However, what the TES community are going to do is they're going to look at this carefully and say, we're not going to do something as silly as that. What we're going to do is use the law to the extent that we can use it. And we're going to then explain the deeming provision and the way it's done. So I, I'm very positive about this. I feel that this is going to work to our advantage. We also feel that the administrative um, purposes of the legislation is going to weed out those companies that can't get their administration in order. They'll weed out those companies that can't register themselves, that have a negative background. All those sorts of things will be weeded out, which will leave the legitimate companies and the legitimate employment agencies, um, a nice gap in the market for all those that have been weeded out. So those companies that are willing to stand surety for their clients, that are willing to go hand in hand and make sure that the law is properly implemented, those companies will do far better than they're doing right now. I think this is the urgent opportunity. Those are willing to go out there and grab this new law, make it work. They're going to do a service both to themselves, to their clients, and to South Africa. Michael, if I can just <clears throat> summarize what I'm hearing is that you're, you're saying that there is a lot of anxiety around the um, say, tighter labor legislation around flexi staffing um, and the push towards more permanent staffing. Um, and, and there are real consequences to the economy of that. However, you're saying that there is a, a a route that can be navigated for a positive outcome. If I could just um, ask you uh, perhaps a macroeconomic question because you touched on what's good mm -hmm. for South Africa. Um, globally, um, temp or let's call it flexi staffing is increasing and a great deal of employment has been created um, in emerging economies through flexi staffing. So it, it's had a, a positive effect in that there has been more employment and more people lifted out of poverty. Um, Given the, the appeal that flexi staffing has to multinationals who land in a new uh, country and, and invest in that country and, and therefore create jobs, and that's something in South Africa, through the DTI and the government, to recognize they want to do to grow the employment in this country as foreign direct investment. Do you feel that there's reason for foreign direct investment to be concerned about more rigid labor law, or do you think this will also work for them? Yeah, I mean, you've hit on a, on a very interesting topic. Um, we need to look at, at two things. First of all, the temporary employment services in South Africa today employ anything up to 2 million people per month. In other words, if you look at the figures, it's up to about 2 million people who are doing atypical, it's called atypical employment. Um, we, from the 50s and 60s and 70s, we used to always look at Japan and they had a nine to five job and they worked from the from the age of seventeen to the age of seventy. That doesn't exist in the world today at all. Um, we only have to look at what's happened in this latest economic downturn from two thousand and eight, which has lasted right through to now, it doesn't exist anymore. People are holding all atypical jobs all around the world. And uh, the foreign nationals are all looking at the South African situation. And they're saying, can we make this work for us? So I have clients uh, of my own that are asking the questions and are asking, can we still conduct ourselves in the same manner in which we used to uh, previously when the laws changed? And the answer is a resounding yes, uh, we can. Um, Namibia, three years ago, tried to ban labor broking. They did. Um, it got banned. It was taken to the constitutional court in Namibia and it was overthrown. In the process, Namibia lost half a million jobs. They weren't taken on as permanent, they lost 
half a million, million jobs, the government panicked and they've reversed the entire situation. What we need to look at is what's happening in Europe because they're starting to turn the corner. Angela Merkel has done a wonderful thing. She's the new Iron Lady of Europe. What she's done is she's brought in a typical employment and she's created that as the typical employment. In other words, it's become the greater amount of jobs are done through the TESs, the labor brokers, and the employment services. People are holding down two or three jobs each. They're working three hours here, two hours there, and maybe one hour there. Uh, people are working from home. People are using computer technology and working um, in all sorts of environments. So the world is a changed spot uh, from when many of us remember in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It's completely changed. And I think South Africa has to grapple with that problem. Uh, we've just had the latest uh, quarterly review that's been produced by our government. And even the statistician general has said that we need to look at something different. Uh, we need to look at the unemployment. We've just had the um, director of the Reserve Bank um, coming forward. And she's saying that we need to have a look at productivity. We need to have a look at how we employ people. So I think this is growing. It's a growing area of atypical employment. And it's up to the business community to say, how are we going to grow it? How, what are we going to do? Government doesn't, it doesn't create jobs. They are there purely to create the environment so that the business community can create the job. And we found as a business community that we have to emulate the rest of the world. And the rest of the world are moving that way. I've just recently been to New York, and I haven't met one individual on my tours in New York where people are doing typical employment, the 9 to 5 job. No one does a 9 to 5 job. People are working around the clock. Some people have a job that they work from 4 in the morning till 10 in the morning. Um, so it depends on what you're doing and how you're going to keep the economy running. So yes, Dermot, you're right. Um, atypical employment is the way to go, and yes, we've got to rely on the experts, such as the employment agencies, who can then guide us through this. The employment agencies are going hand in hand with the labor consultants, with the labor lawyers, and they're making sure that they get this right, and they can guide you into the future. So, um, just in terms of thinking about what you're saying and some of the trends that we're seeing um, in South Africa globally, um, I think South Africa is looking to grow employment. It's also trying to move into the knowledge economy, and I think aligned to what you're saying, the knowledge economy is not one that um, perhaps suits the sort of permanent traditional uh, uh, employment model. So there's a tension there with perhaps what South Africa is wanting to do and what it's actually doing. The other tension is if we're trying to grow foreign direct investment, um, perhaps some of these employment policies while navigatable and not perhaps fully aligned to it. And then the third aspect, I suppose, and this is where the unions are coming from perhaps, is that atypical employment doesn't tend towards people signing up uh, to unions. And, and that's globally, um, that's been a trend. So the government, obviously, with pressure from the unions, have that interest, but they're fighting the current. They're kind of canoed. Yeah. So ultimately, do you think where is in in a in a long term vision where do you think South Africa is going to align with the rest of the world and this is a battle the unions can't win? Or? Yeah, in fact, the unions are already dropping in their numbers. Um, we've obviously seen on the mines what's taking place that uh, the traditional unions are being challenged uh, by new unions. The numbers are dropping quite radically, not only because of retrenchment and not only because of the fallout of the employment numbers, but people are saying. The unions aren't delivering what I need. You take the typical entrance into the new market, the person coming out, they're young, they're 24 years old, got a computer science degree. That person doesn't want to wear a suit and a tie. They want to wear sandals and a T-shirt. They want to have their laptop. They want to deliver. They want to get paid on productivity. And they want to be recognized for what they can do. That's not typical employment by any stretch of the imagination. That person has got the fingertips of the future. They're going to say, I want what I want. I want to earn decent money. I don't want to get caught in the 
Uh, rush hour from 9 to 5. I don't want to get, get caught into rush hour in the early morning, and I certainly don't want to leave work at 5 o'clock. If I'm needed at work at 11 o'clock at night, I'll be there. So those are the people that the agencies, the employment agencies, will start chasing in the future. Yes, there are still the typical jobs. A builder still has to be at the building site and still has to know what bricklaying is and has got to be there at certain times and has to fit in. But I think what we're seeing now is that what I saw, for instance, in Taiwan, where building sites are under floodlights at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, are employing people. There's a night shift to come in. The bricklayers come in at 12 o'clock at night and start laying bricks. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what's going on in this world. And with these figures of the enormous unemployment that we have in South Africa, it can't be business as usual. It won't be business as usual. Uh, Mrs. Marcus of our Reserve Bank has said just that. Uh, only two days ago, she addressed the law conference and said, it won't be business as usual. We need to think laterally. And how are we going to do it? How we, where are we going to move to? So Africa can't go beyond the wayside. And I, and I, I strongly believe that um, the South African economists, the South African business community, are not going to sit back and let this become a wasteland. They're not going to allow the trade unions to wag the dog. It's the tail wagging the dog. Unfortunately, at the moment, just before, we are facing an election next year, early next year. And unfortunately, yes, the Saudi is wagging the ANC. And they are very worried because without the, the SOTU management tools, they can't actually run a full election. They can't get the people to come out there and vote. The SOTU has got an office every five kilometers. So they can, in fact, at the end of the day, um, get the people out there to come and vote. I believe that we're going to have a, a sea change straight after our elections. Um, the SOTU is going to possibly think about breaking ranks with the ANC. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that right now. And I think what's really, what's really swaying this is, in fact, the employment market. The employment market needs to change. No one who has the ability to work and can't find a job is going to sit back and say, are they happy? They're going to say, either we're going to turn to the low road, and quote Ken, Ken Santa, yeah, they're going to turn to what happened in the um, North Africa, in the Arab Spring, and they're going to come out to the streets and shout the odds, or they're going to buck the system and it's going to be each person for themselves, and they're going to say, we're not going to be a union member, we want a job, and we want to do it as per the atypical employment. It's up to the business community, it's up to the people in, with the knowledge of the labor law to say, how can we make this labor law, how can we twist it? to fit in with what is needed. And I think we're going to get there. Um, in Europe, Angela Merkel's done it. She's done an amazing job, absolutely amazing. She said there is no person in Germany today, 18 years old, that can say they've got nothing to do. If they can't find a job, she'll put them in some sort of training. If they can't find some sort of training, she'll put them in a tertiary educational institution or even in an apprenticeship. But there's no one in Germany today that can say, unless they're lazy or drug addicts or something else, they can say that. When you go around Europe, and I challenge anyone to go off to Spain, for instance, where there is high unemployment, all the youth are learning German. Why do you think they're learning German? And the reason is because they know that if they've got the German language, they'll be able to find some sort of employment somewhere along the line. So we, we're moving. And as a business community, we're not prepared to put up with a little bit of negativity in legislation. Yes, the international market are looking at South Africa and they're saying, in terms of hiring and firing, you're number 144 out of 145. You almost hit rock bottom. It's bad. What's going on over there? And we're sending out the message from the labor law community saying, don't worry about it. It looks bad. We'll make it work. So I, I don't think that the, the negativity shouldn't rule supreme. Well, I'm sure I'm all those people working for industry bodies trying to get primary investment to come here will be happy to hear that. Um, and one of the pleasures of um, uh, Michael is that he very rarely sits on the fence, as you all now know. Um, in regards to um, the other side of what you spoke about at the HR Exec Forum uh, back in June, 
Um, you spoke about CCMA, and obviously CCMA is always evolving. Um, and you spoke about some things around the principle of fairness, the golden uh, thread, yeah. how we got to where we are, but also what you're seeing in terms of actual um, on-the-ground practice at, at CCMA. So perhaps if we could pivot on to that, Mike, we could talk a bit about that. We certainly can. Uh, when the business community were faced with the Commission for Conciliation, Mediation, and Arbitration, which was the new arbitration body that was set up in terms of the labor legislation, uh, this was almost 20 years ago, the business community threw their hands up in the air and said, this is disaster. Again, there was blood in the streets. Uh, we, we won't be able to conduct business anymore. Small businesses will go bankrupt. We will be at the behest of the trade unions. We've got absolute disaster on our, on our front door. Now, as the Chinese said, we, 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 that certain uh, emergency became the urgent opportunity. People came out and they said, we're going to make this work. We're going to make this body work. What the business community did was they learnt the laws. They learnt and understood the rules and regulations of the CCMA. They put pressure on the management of the CCMA. They said, train arbitrators. Train them to understand the business community. Train them to understand how business is conducted. And train them in understanding the law itself. And that golden thread of fairness that runs through the Labor Relations Act. Well, we had the pendulum. The pendulum, right in the beginning, was very much in favor of the unions, of the staff member, and of the applicants in their jobs. But the pendulum has swung, and it's swung right to the middle, where you see now the business community has learned the rules. They've learned and understood what is expected of them. They know how to fire people. Today, you have businesses who go down to the CCMA are absolutely confident that they followed the processes, they've got a good reason, and they understand what they've done is correct and in terms of the law. And you'll find now that over 75% of the cases are found in favor of the employer because they followed the processes carefully. It's taken us a bit of time as a business community, but now we're absolutely satisfied that the CCMA is providing the service it's creating some labor peace. Well, admittedly, not in the agricultural industry and in the mining industry, but the labor strike days have dropped quite radically uh, since the advent of the CCMA. So it's a body that's working, and in fact, many of us are using it as a business tool. We're saying to our staff member, if you're very unhappy, if you don't want to do your job, go to the CCMA. Let them try and sort you out. And in fact, People, you'll find a lot of the business community are referring people down to the CCMA. Then go there, let's have it done. Instead of us fighting for the next five years at the workplace, go and have it tested there. And the business community are finding that they, they've got a willing ear from the CCMA. I'm very happy that what has now turned out is a mature body. It's a body that understands us fully. In regards to um, that, Michael, I think that... In terms of the, the, the thinking back on the sort of macro environment and, and the strike and, and how that affects things like business and, and investment and also um, unions and the youth, you seem to be, what I'm hearing is you seem to be saying that to some degree even the labor force, the labor market themselves have found it to be a voice they didn't perhaps have. So it, it's not just businesses benefiting from this, they also yeah. have their benefit. Is that true? Uh, yeah, the, the employees are starting to understand um, that it doesn't help to go out on a strike. Uh, we're getting the message out there, if you take one week off on strike, you don't earn. To, even if you get a 5% increase because you had went off on strike, it's going to take you a year to catch that money up that you've lost from the time that you've been off on strike. And the business community is sending that message out there. I think our labor force is maturing somewhat. Um, the trade unions haven't matured, they haven't understood this, they don't want to understand it because it's not in their interest to understand it. Remember, the trade unions represent those in employment. They don't represent the unemployed and they certainly don't speak on behalf of businesses. And they don't understand that the greater the profit, the greater the incentive to employ more people. No one understands that. My view and my take on this is that we are moving into a mature economy. We're moving out of the third world economy. 
here in South Africa. Um, we, we just have to look at the foreign investment that's coming in. People are starting to invest and they're getting decent returns from businesses in South Africa. So my, my strong understanding of this is that we're going to be able to reflect the mature, mature economy um, that we so rightly deserve to reflect. And I think our staff are starting to understand that. When our Reserve Bank is talking about productivity, they're not talking about that because of something they feel like talking about. They're talking about that because that's what they want and they understand it. When our trade unions are being pushed back by their own members and saying, we don't want to remain a member of Kasatu, which is the umbrella body of the trade union movement, because they're not giving us what we want. We want to talk about bread and butter issues. How can we have some sort of surety that this business will stay solvent? How can we have some sort of surety that we will get an increase and that we are starting to understand that we'll only get the increase if there's productivity and there's profit. Otherwise, no one's going to give you that increase. So I think the international business community need to have a look at us more carefully. I know that we're getting many, many investigations from businesses around the world for looking at us. Um, Cape Town itself has become a, a hub. Um, for instance, we've got investments from every corner of the globe. It's, it's actually quite an interesting phenomenon that's happening here in Cape Town. Just um, in, in terms of coming to the end of our, our talk, Michael, thank you for yeah, taking time to talk us through these issues. Um, if you had to sum up in three steps um, the three things, given all the circumstances there around the CCMA, that employers should be aware of and should make sure they're prepared for with CCMA, what would you say those three key steps are? Well, obviously, we need to get into place the paperwork. They need to have proper letters of appointment, proper contracts of employment. They need to have terms and conditions of employment that are in place, disciplinary codes. They need to get all the paperwork and the understanding of the labor law in place. Once they've got that understanding in place, you then need properly trained management to implement these systems because at the moment what is happening is the only businesses that are suffering are those that don't implement the systems that are there. Tried and tested systems. There is that golden thread of fairness. We need to make sure that we can reflect that everything we've done is fair. The only way you're going to reflect it is once the system's in place. And that's important. What you also need to do is you need to have an educated workforce. People need to be trained. They need to understand what's expected of them. They need to understand the terms and conditions of the employment themselves. They need a proper induction process. And then finally, what businesses need to do, and it's absolutely vital, is that they need to invest in their own businesses. And that means investment in staff as well. Sure. And then uh, moving back to um, the TES regulation, and given that it's not all finalized yet, but with the understanding we have, to prepare for that um, and get ready for that, what do you think the three things are that business should do? Uh, well, the three things are education, education, and education. Uh, we, can't, we can't emphasize that enough. The business community must go to the experts, the employment agencies, and they must go to them, get the training, understand what's around the corner, and understand how they can adapt their businesses to fit in with those new regulations. So it does boil down to education. Obviously, it also boils down to an open mind. Uh, the business community need to understand that it won't be business as usual. There is a difference in the way we're going to handle the businesses. And we need to ensure that we embrace that difference with full vigor. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for your time. Um, we will um, make Michael's um, contact details and, and his website page available on this. And I'm sure Michael will be happy to speak to you if you have any queries around labor law or some of the other issues we spoke about today.